I think somebody needs to stop Greta in the streets and ask her. Someone on the red carpet, she's go she's gonna be at the Oscars. <laughs> Someone shout, which Narnia book? <laughs> Welcome to Talking Beasts from NarniaWeb.com, where we explore the world of C.S. Lewis and keep a watchful eye on the latest Narnia movie news. This is Talking Beasts. Welcome back to Talking Beasts. I'm Glumpuddle. Greta Gerwig is on the cover of Time Magazine as one of their Women of the Year, and the article and video includes several interesting quotes about the two Chronicles of Narnia movies she is writing and directing for Netflix. C.S. Lewis Narnia books are something that I've loved since I was a child. I would say the two big books of my childhood were Little Women and um, the Narnia books. Uh, so I had that you know, instant excitement, but instant terror that comes from trying to tackle something that has shaped me. Now, listeners, if you've not read the article, let me just temper your expectations. We still don't have a production schedule, still don't have a release date, and we still don't know which two Narnia books Gerwig is working on. Or do we? Uh, it's kind of crazy. It's kind of frustrating. Uh, there's a lot of little things to dive into here, and I thought this was the perfect opportunity to finally have on the podcast Narnia Web News poster, Impending Doom. Impending Doom, welcome to Talking Beasts. Thank you. Thank you very much. In many ways, I feel like a young Caspian meeting the Pevensies for the first time of seeing his childhood heroes up close of like, wow, these people are real. Glum Puddle, really, and <laughs> Jim Fan. They're real. Well, we, um, we, well we, we've talked before. We, we, we chat on Slack all the time talking about new, Narnia Web News stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, but it does feel a little surreal to be here uh, recording a podcast episode um, with with a podcast um, I've spent so many hours listening to um, and just binging over the last 15 years. So I'm very excited to be here. Listeners, uh, you may not know Doom, but you know his work. Uh, Impending Doom and the Rose Tree Dryad are the ones who scour the interwebs. For any scrap of Narnia news, there may be. And of course, Doom, you also built the Narnia web Instagram pretty much from scratch. So it, it, it's about time uh, ha, ha, got your voice uh, on the show today. So uh, my feeling, overall, I think the response to this article from Narnia Webbers has been quite positive. I've seen several variations of I moved from cautiously optimistic to simply optimistic. A number of people have said like that. But that said... I want to talk about the most maddening part of this article first. <laughs> and uh, Time says that Gerwig is working on, and I quote, a new adaptation of the first book in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia series, <laughs> which clears everything up. You know, we've been wondering. Thank you, Time. What's Gerwig going to do? All we know is she's working on two movies. Don't know which ones, but thank you very much, Time Magazine, for clearing that up. Oh, she's working on... The first book, which is so, which is such an obvious, cut and dry, uh, clear cut thing in the world of Narnia. Uh, did this has this driven you to the brink of? I think you, I haven't seen you talk much about it in the news poster Slack channel. Me and Rose have been kind of banging our heads against the keyboard. Ha, have you been as close to the brink of insanity of, as we have been about this? It just doesn't make much sense, <laughs> you know, like. Time magazine, they have this big feature interview with Greta Gerwig. They have they have quotes from Steven Spielberg, Netflix CEO, and the closest we get is the first book. Magician's nephew or Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. Just come out and say it, please. I've, if I was intentionally trying to drive Narnia fans crazy, I, I think this is what I would write. <laughs> I, I don't think I could do any better than this. Um Maybe Greta or someone casually said the first book or something, and they just ran with it and didn't realize, hey, uh, this is Narnia. You got to be more specific than that if you're talking about The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is the actual first book, the first one written, or The Magician's Nephew, which, for better or worse, has a number one on the spine. It has a big number one on the spine right now because they're, they're ordered chronologically. I don't know. I mean, later in the article, Gerwig does mention Fawns and Father Christmas. But also prior to this, in a, in a different interview, a different podcast, she mentioned the wood between the worlds to describe. Right. And I, which I took as just, oh, she's just trying to describe where she is in her creative process. Um, 
So you could look at it both ways. I mean, or we could get both. She's working on two movies, and we've always thought for a while, hey, probably going to be Magician's Nephew and Lion, the Witch, in the Wardrobe. So I'm pretty positive that time has no more insider knowledge than we do in this case. I think if if you've been paying attention to the production, we've had probably close to a dozen interviews with either Gerwig or Scott Stuber or other Netflix execs referencing the project development since July. Um, and there's been no explicit acknowledgement one way or the other. Like you mentioned, there's been some teases with the wood between the worlds and now specifically mentioning Father Christmas. Um, but if you notice in the video itself, um, there was the article that came out uh, for time, but they also had a, a six minute feature interview. Um, and in the video, she's very intentionally not saying a specific book she's is adapting. It's always the Narnia books meant so much to me as a kid. Um, so I, I, I feel like they just have no idea. And that's an assumption on their part. Because I wondered, I wondered if maybe it was just something where, well, because because most uh, all the most pretty much all the interviews you're talking about that have come out over the past several months, especially in the wake of Barbie being such a hit. Um, it's like it's all about Barbie, and then someone throws in a question about Narnia at the end. So it's not that surprising. You know, they're not an Ar- they're not Narnia Webbers. It's not talking beasts that they, they don't follow up and say, "Wait, tell us more. <laughs> Who's playing Peter?" You know, I mean, they don't follow up. Um, so, so I, I always wondered if it was maybe it's not a big secret. Maybe just no one's asking the question. Um, but this does, yeah, this makes it seem like. This was the first time I went. It really does seem like they're very intentionally trying to, to, to um, keep it a secret for now, which two they're working on. And I've seen comments from fans just like, when is somebody just going to straight up ask her, which book are you adapting first? <laughs> and I just, I feel that so much. Uh-huh. I'm, I'm right there with you. I think I think somebody needs to stop Greta in the streets and ask her. Hey, Someone on the red carpet, she's, she's going to be at the Oscars, <laughs> someone shout, which Narnia book? And if she says, I can't tell you, that's fine. That's totally fine. I, I can handle that. What I can't handle is the ambiguity. And what I especially can't handle is saying, oh, it's the first book. Don't even worry about it, guys. We're answering your question. We're going on five years of the debate of, like, Netflix acquired it in 2018, and it's been five years of... One camp saying they have to make Magician's Nephew first. The other, the publication purist of The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe or nothing at all. That's how you start a franchise. I belong to the camp that says Magician's Nephew should be first. This may be a discussion for, I'm sure it's been had. For these next adaptations, you mean? Correct. Yeah. Uh, I want to clear that up. <laughs> for the reading order, you read publication. <laughs> um But I belong to the group that says The Magician's Nephew. I think the single biggest predictor um, for us to see all seven books adapted is dependent on Netflix starting with The Magician's Nephew. Um, And yeah, I could. there's a lot of reasons why I think that. Um, Maybe that's for another episode. So you're saying if, if you see Magician's Nephew announced as the first book, that would convey to you, oh, this is Netflix very clearly saying we want to do all seven. Whereas if they announced wardrobe first, you wouldn't be so confident about that. Right. I Because I think you fall into the same trap um, that BBC and Walden um, fall into of you're making your franchise. Um, really, you're handcuffing yourself to Prince Caspian, um, which is a more difficult book um, to adapt. Um, I think what's special about The Magician's Nephew, in this context of being the first book adapted in this new set of series, um, is it shows audiences that Narnia is more than just the Pevensey children, right? Think about like like universes, um, Star Wars, Harry Potter, Indiana Jones, like those, um, you have your core players, you have your main cast, and those series live and die by those same handful of, of characters that started the franchise. Um, and they struggle when they venture elsewhere. So I think having new characters to introduce the world, um, our world to um, first would be, it would, it would provide a smoother transition for future books, I imagine. And a smoother transition for people that are 
familiar with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, which is, you know, most people in general, I think, are somewhat familiar with Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, because there's a lot of connections, obviously, between Magician's Nephew and Wardrobe. You could market it as a prequel to that story you know. Um, Nathan, in the Talking Beast Facebook group, said he thinks it'll be Magician's Nephew first, and he's wondering if they'll tie it more directly into Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Maybe it opens with Professor Kirk... um, you know, narrating the story, like an old, older Professor Kirk narrating the story of the magician's nephew or something like that. Um, so yeah, that that's uh, that seems like kind of the that seems like kind of the fairly obvious way to go. Um, but, but we'll see. Um, please post a comment below. I mean, we've, there's a hundred other stories where we've asked you to comment on this, but keep going. What do you think uh, Gerwig's up to, and um, which two will she do? Which two should they do? Uh, but there's more in this article. Netflix CEO Ted Sarandos had an interesting quote about Gerwig's take on Narnia. He said, and I quote, It won't be counter to how the audience may have imagined those worlds, but it will be bigger and bolder than they thought. And he described her world building as, quote, rooted in faith, much like Lewis's original material. This is the part of the interview that drove that was more frustrating for me as a fan. I read his comments as as nothing. Like, it's pure marketing PR fluff. Producer speak. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It means Mm -hmm. nothing. He says nothing here. Um, Yeah, bigger, bolder than than what the books, than the previous movies. (laughs) It doesn't matter. I rolled my eyes when I read his comments here. I'm with you. I'm bringing it up. There are some. Um, Samuel in the Talking Beast Facebook group said it was. It felt like a major red flag, uh, and I can understand that. Uh, I remember that was a big. That was a sore point when the Walden movies were coming out. There were a lot of references in the marketing to it's going to be epic. It's going to be big. It's going to be awesome. And um, there was this sensitivity to um, them trying to make Narnia on the same canvas as Lord of the Rings. So I understand the sensitivity to that. But I would generally agree with you that this is just producer speak. Specifically, I think he's trying to do two things at the same time. Obviously, Greta Gerwig is one of the big names in the industry right now. She's one of the major directors and one of the most recognizable. Her name is one of the most recognizable among directors in the world at the moment. And so he wants to sell the, yes, these are going to be Greta Gerwig movies. Hey, you, all you people out there who loved Barbie and loved Greta Gerwig and are rooting for her at the Oscars, yeah, you're going to get another Greta Gerwig movie. It's going to be very Greta Gerwig-y. Oh, but those of you who love the Narnia books, don't worry about it. It's going to be exactly what you imagined. And those two (laughs) things might be somewhat contradictory, but that's why it's producer speak. It's like, who is this for? Don't worry, it's for everybody. Um, So I think that's what he's trying to do there, is juggle those two things of saying, yes, it's a Greta Gerwig movie, but don't worry about it, Narnia Webbers. Um, We're not going way off the deep end here. Yeah. And I I mean, when you think about um, in the context of the full article, you you have Gerwig, um, who clearly has a lot of respect and reverence um, for the books. Um, So on one hand, um, you kind of get the sense that maybe Netflix execs are kind of playing both cards. Um, But at this point, it seems Gerwig is very much like she's saying all the right things for me as a fan of the books someone who wants to see the books treated with respect in their adaptation. I'm, I'm impressed with how much Gerwig um, clearly recognizes the source material, respects it, and is familiar with it. That's the, the perfect segue into kind of the last major point. The last major takeaway from the article here is uh, there's an interesting part in the video that's embedded into the article where Gerwig references something from one of C.S. Lewis's essays. And to me, it, it seems like the interviewer must have asked her something like, what are your hopes or goals for the Narnia movies? And so it seems like in response, Greta Gerwig said, C.S. Lewis said that the goal of you know writing fantasy, you know, something from his imagination, he'd say, let's say you wrote about an enchanted forest. The goal would be that then every time you walk into a forest, after you read it, you say to yourself, maybe this is an enchanted forest. So that's a tall order, but um, I guess re-enchantment of the world. <laughs> no, no, no problem there. By that last part, I think she'd sort of meant, yeah, I guess re-enchantment of the world is one of the things I want people to get out of these movies. 
Um, so if you don't know, Gerwig is referencing an essay Lewis wrote in 1952 titled On Three Ways of Writing for Children. The actual quote from Lewis is, quote, A child does not despise real woods because he has read of enchanted woods. The reading makes all real woods a little enchanted. This is a special kind of longing. So yeah, is this the first time we've seen a Narnia director like specific, kind of very specifically reference another one of C.S. Lewis's works? I mean, when I, when I think of that, I go like, no, Michael Apted or Andrew Adamson, they must have said something, <laughs> right? But nothing is coming to mind right now. No, like, and just re um, going into the the discussion this evening, um, I was pulling up old quotes from Michael Apted and Andrew Adamson about the books um, themselves. And like they're sure this is taken maybe a little bit out of context, but you get the sense that Gerwig is much more familiar with that. She likes them for what they are. Um, Michael Apted, um, he had famously had the quote of one of the problems in the book is that there's no villain and all good adventure stories have villains. Like he actually said that guy. If you weren't a part of Narnia Web at the time, that's an actual quote from Michael Apted. He, act, the director of Voyage of the Dawn Treader, actually said, <laughs> "You know, the problem with the, that all great adventure stories have to have a villain." And he was explaining why they added the green mist. So obviously, and also saying the the the, the journey in the book doesn't really have a purpose. When I think to so when I think of my, definitely Michael Apted, and to an extent Andrew Adamson, I tend to remember the problems they had with the book. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Adamson talked about, wow, there was a lot less there than I remembered. And I understand why he said that, that whole, I wanted to make, I wanted to make the movie out of my memory of the book. I, that doesn't bother me. I, 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 I totally understand why he said that. And that, that's fine. But uh, I, there's a number of quotes about Adamson talking about the book and they're mostly negative. Um, so it's, it is nice at this early stage to hear from the director a lot of positive things and this uh, this she talked about having reverence for the source material and then kind of backing it like kind of saying I, I don't think she's just saying it like she just pulled out a quote from not not just like one of lewis's other famous well not just not screw tape letters or something but an essay um like that's that's pretty that's pretty nerdy um and even i was like even and again the slack group i was like okay I, where, where was that quote from again i forget where lewis said that so um <laughs> That's does it guarantee a great adaptation? Nope. Does it guarantee a great movie? Not at all. Um, but at this point, it just feels nice. That's all. That's all I'm saying. It's just nice to see. Exactly. And it, it's after so many years of Narnia filmmakers seemingly minimizing or attempting to twist Narnia into something it's not intended to be or it never was. Harry Potter fill in the blank of the popular franchise of the of the year. It's refreshing to hear that the director, writer, um, is praising the book for what they are. Like she mentioned um, that the books aren't schematic. It's it's like purposely a mismatched collection of, of the stories that C.S. Lewis loved the most. And Andrew Adamson, it seemingly tried to steer away from that um, and try to make it more of a universe, more yes. Lord, Lord of the Rings, essentially. Yeah, I think so. I mean, that was one of the first things... I mean, even before Andrew Adamson was on board, Michael Flaherty, then president of Walden Media, like at their initial meeting with the estate, said, you know, promised to make a movie that was of the same quality as Lord of the Rings. So I think that kind of Lord of the Rings shadow, Lord of the Rings cast a very big shadow on those productions. And I completely agree with you that it is refreshing. And even we had the quote from Mark Gordon talking about uh, this is you know, this is several years ago before Netflix got involved. But. I'm sorry, this is talking about kind of why Netflix initially got involved before Gerwig necessarily was. But Mark Gordon said, you know, anything that looks or smells like Game of Thrones, people are, are gobbling it up right now. And Narnia had 3,000 characters. So it, it is refreshing to see the director say, I love Narnia for its narnia ness not because it's vaguely similar to something else. Um, and that full quote, just to uh, read what you're talking about, it's another interesting part of this Time Magazine article where Gerwig says she is drawn to the, quote, euphorically dreamlike quality of Lewis's writing. And Gerwig says, quote, it's connected to the folklore and fairy stories of England, but it's a combination of different traditions. As a child, you accept the whole thing, that you're in this land of Narnia, 
there's Fonz, and then Father Christmas shows up. It doesn't even occur to you that it's not schematic. I'm interested in embracing the paradox of the worlds that Lewis created because that's what's so compelling about them. End quote. I, I, I love it. And even Adamson in the comments, yeah, we're clapping. It's just someone's <laughs> the director talking about, hey, I love all this stuff that might seem like a challenge. I love it. I remember Michael Flaherty. I forget when this and the then president of Walden Media. Um, uh, remember him saying, you know, there are you have to understand there's tough bits in the Narnia books. And he specifically referenced the um the romp with Bacchus and Silenus and the uh, implication of people getting drunk during that whole dance and everything. Um but the whole kind of whole, hey, there's really tough bits here and can't necessarily do that in a movie. And I'm not saying those none of those are valid points, but it's just refreshing to hear people just excited about these books are really or in this case, the director. These books are really good. By no means does it guarantee the books the movies are gonna be awesome. That's all that matters ultimately. Um but there's a lot of people that love Narnia and are very knowledgeable about Narnia that aren't qualified to turn it into a movie. Being able to adapt it is a different thing. Um, but it's just nice to see. I will say there's probably – I'm surprised there hasn't been more people in the kind of Planet Narnia crowd that I've that have commented about. You know, she says it's not schematic. And she's kind of saying it's more of – she's more on the Devin Brown side of that argument where Devin Brown's more, yeah, it's a little bit weird the way Lewis mixes mythologies, but – yeah, that's kind of the whole point. Then on the other side, again, on the other side, you have Dr. Michael Ward, author of Planet Narnia, saying, "No, no, no, it's actually all lines up perfectly." Yeah. So I mean, maybe I I wouldn't put it past Gerwig to have read Planet Narnia and some of Michael Ward's uh, books. Um, so maybe we'll get uh, if we get a chance to interview her um, at Narnia Web, we can uh, maybe make reference of that. But but like you mentioned, the scenes um, in Prince Caspian, the romp, um, the Free, freeing of the statues in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the snow dance in The Silver Chair. It's these little moments um, within the context of the books, um, but they're just so powerful and atmospheric and beautiful, frankly, just joyful and important thematically to what the book is about. And we've had just a history of, of these being minimized, um, in favor of, of the action sequence. And that's one thing about Gerwig um, for all of um, some concerns that fans have. I do think, I, I don't think we're going to have an issue um, of battles becoming a, a main focus for the story. Um, I'm reminded of a story in um, that Gerwig told um, during the press um, press tour for Barbie of um, of a scene that studio executives wanted to kind of ax out of the film um, so there's a scene in the movie, Barbie's just entered the real world, um, and there's this really small moment um, where Barbie's sitting on a bench, and there's this elderly woman uh, next to her, and she kind of tells her, you're so beautiful. And mm -hmm. like the scene doesn't go anywhere. It's a, it's a cul-de-sac moment, she called it, um, and executives wanted her to cut it, but to her, this is the quote, if I cut the scene... I don't know what the movie is about. To me, this is the heart of the movie. And I just think that's that's someone I want involved with a Narnia production. Wow, that's a really great quote you brought up. I totally forgot about that with Barbie. And yeah, uh, I feel like, I think she's, I just think that, I'm not saying I'm going to like everything she's going to do with Narnia. I may, in fact, not like much of it because I still have, there's still reasons I have, there's still some reservations and some, some concerns I have about Gerwig directing Narnia. But I think whatever she does, she'll be very, I think she knows what she's talking about. And whatever she does will be very deliberate. Whereas I get the sense there are things in the Walden movies that often, essentially there were changes, a lot of the big changes might have been made somewhat unintentionally. Just because they didn't quite realize they had changed that. I mean, the, probably the most obvious one is the line in Prince Caspian, where in the book Aslan says, "Every year you grow, you will find me bigger," and in the movie it was changed to, "Every year you grow, so shall so I." So shall I. Yeah. Now, like at a glance, they seem the same, but you think about it, it's like that actually means something really different. And so there's a number of things that I felt they were um, making they didn't quite understand that they were changing something, and. I think Gerwig, whatever she changes, she will know she's changing it, and she'll have very specific reasons uh, for, for doing it. Um, so 
just coming out of this article, I've talked about some of my concerns in past episodes, and those still stand. But just coming out of this article, once the frustration about the whole first book thing kind of calms down, <laughs> makes me feel makes me feel good. At this point in history, I I feel good about Greta Gerwig, and I, I, like I said before, it sounds like a lot of Narnie Webbers that generally this has shifted things. Everyone feels a little bit better um, after reading this, and it sounds like you the same. Yeah. Who would have thought um, Impending Doom and Glum Puddle with the, our usernames <laughs> would be so positive uh, about about this? But yeah, hey, like, it's even impressive. Even Glum Puddle and Impending Doom are feeling pretty good at this point in time. So <laughs> something's happening. <laughs> um, uh, now, uh, the Rose Tree Dryad in the uh, News Poster Slack channel uh, coined the term Gerwiggle. Which is genius. Yes. We, ha- we haven't decided, though. I would love to hear for the comment section. Um, now, look, I'm not jumping on board and saying I'm a Greta Gerwig person or whatever. We, we, we got to see. Um, just that the, it's All I'm saying is this article made me feel good. That's all I'm saying. But a Gerwiggle, if, oh, I want to know for the comment section. First off, yes, it's genius. If you're a Gerwiggle, if you identify as a Gerwiggle, does that mean you're excited about <laughs> Greta Gerwig doing Narnia or you're... Not at all excited about Greta Gerwig doing Narnia. Um, how do, I, I tend to think of it as a negative thing. I probably next chance I get because um, you know Rillian. Last I checked, Rillian is still kind of on the pretty pe- quite pessimistic about uh, Netflix's Narnia and Greta Gerwig. So next time he says something like that, I'm going to say, "Oh, don't be such a Gerwiggle." So. That, that's where I think. So I'd love to know for the comments section. What do you think of is Gerwiggle? Is that a hashtag we should get started? And should it be for the people that are excited or not excited? This is now this is the first time I'm hearing the term Gerwiggle out loud before it was just in text. <laughs> and I have to admit, it looks it looks much better in text than it does saying it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Narni Web News Poster Impending Doom, finally on Talking Beasts. Uh Do you want to do the honors and take the outro? Uh, It would be an honor. I'd love to. And here we go. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Talking Beasts, the Narnia podcast. Visit NarniaWeb.com to join our community and stay up to date on the latest Narnia news. Please post a comment or question below or in the Talking Beasts Facebook group. Special thanks to all our Patreon supporters, especially our Knights of Narnia Web. Until next time, further up and further in.